Uh, so essentially in terms of history in the late 1800s, um, early 1900s um, was essentially when this um, trans cranial cella approach started, but the mortality rate was high um, for multiple different reasons, um, including at this time, there also was an antibiotic, but um, essentially the first uh, attempt at treating pituitary tumors transcranially was in the 18, 1893 by Catton and Paul, um, but they never actually got to the tumor and the patient died um, during that time. And then in Austria, um, the first successful transferenoidal resection was performed um, in 1906, and then Arvid Cushing kind of took that upon himself thereafter um, and worked on refining the approach. But even at that time, the mortality rate was, was high, and for him, it was 5.6%, which if we compare that to what it is uh, currently, that's you know, for any surgery, that's pretty high. Um, and then during the time, you know, he wasn't satisfied with uh, the basically transcranial approaches and simultaneously was working on improving his transcranial mortality rate for everything else um, and was able to bring that to 4.5. So he kind of shifted back to transcranial approach for these tumors. Um, and the first transcranial approach that Cushing performed was in 1909 and it was for a patient for, with um, acromegaly, which I think, yeah, this was the patient that he, um, the first patient for acromegaly that Christian had operated on. But um, so anyway, so then uh, Hirsch, who's an uh, ortholaryngologist, um, and Christian's, uh, Hirsch was an ortholaryngologist that was also working on perfecting transcranial surgeries at that time. And Christian also was trying to perfect his approach before he ultimately switched to transcranial approach. And interestingly, they have worked on the submucosal transeptal approach on the same day. So they're cre both credited simultaneously for that. Um, Cushing's had many trainees and as he transitioned to transcranial approach, one of his trainees died, um, essentially took that back home to, to Scotland and continued to use the, use the transcranial approach and, and perfect that. Um, and also then trained um, uh, Gerard Gu, um, who also took that and kind of continued to perfect that. And uh, he, he's credited for introducing fluoroscopy for guidance, which some neurosurgeons still do to this day in terms of using uh, fluoro um, in terms of navigating the way um, endo endonasally to the, to the cella. Um, and then this went on to already being trained. Um, a lot of the instrumentation that we use currently are um, named um, after Hardy um, from a trans uh, phenoidal perspective. Um, and then this was how the microscope was introduced. Um, and then subsequent to that, um, this just shows that, you know, people continue to try to perfect um, access to the sphenoid. Um, some of it was through the face, which was very disfiguring and then transition to sublabial approach. Um, which was sublabial transeptal, which was done by Hirsch and, um, and Cushions. And then overall, um, and then subsequent to that, it ended up being endonasal transeptal using, using the microscope. And again, this is just showing some of those approaches and some of the transcranial approaches as well um, to the sphenoid and cella region. Uh, this is showing the uh, trans, uh, sublabial transeptal approach um, and the, uh, the type of anesthesia and, um, that was used uh, back then as well. Um, this is the first endoscope over here. So at the, as we talked about um, the endoscope, so it started with the microscope um, and then the endoscope was introduced. This was the very first um, endoscope. Um, Bozani, a German physician, is essentially credited with the invention of the first endoscope. And then uh, Bursch and Hobbs uh, reported the first use of endoscope in pituitary surgery in 1978. Um, although Gear is credited with using it for transferneural approach um, in particular. And then the endoscope has gone through many improvements over time. Clearly the endoscope that we use now is, is far different from, from what that was. Um, and then over time with the endoscope application, uh, cell surgery grew in the mid nineties to where it became pure endoscopic approach um, and the collaboration between ENT and neurosurgery um, flourished. Everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.